Good morning, church. My name is Kendall. Our scripture from this morning comes from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, uh, welcome to our Easter celebration today. I'm grateful that you've chosen to worship with us. For those of you watching online, we're thankful that you've joined us today. I want to begin by sharing you, with you a story that I, I read. It's, it's been three or four years ago now, uh, but it's stuck with me ever since. And uh, it, it's a bit of a, a tragedy, so uh, brace yourself for that. Um, it's a story of the man, uh, man named Timothy Henry Gray. He was found frozen to death under a railway, railway bridge in Wyoming. Uh, now, it was apparent that he'd been homeless for some time. He bore on his body the marks of um, the life of a homeless man who'd lived a, a difficult life. Um, he was in many uh, respects a mess. He'd worked for several of the uh, local ranchers in the area, and uh, due to a PTSD that stemmed from childhood events, uh, he couldn't hold down any job or stay in any one place for very long. As a matter of fact, uh, it, it was really sad that the man had died of exposure to the elements, but he'd actually had an apartment um, not too many months before, uh, yet there he was, frozen to death underneath that railway bridge. As investigators began to dig into his story, uh, they became more puzzled over time than they were when it first started. Uh, as they looked, went through his wallet and identified the man, they found something that really shocked them. It was a fairly sizable check in his wallet made out to Timothy Henry Gray. It's tragic. Here's a man that had everything he needed to get everything, you know, that he could have wanted to keep him alive and healthy and have a safe place to stay. And for whatever reason, he never did cash the check, and they couldn't figure that out. And they continued to dig into his family and his past. And it turns out he was an adoptive grandson of a, a great-grandson of a U.S. senator. And they dug further. They found out that he was actually the heir to the vast fortune of a woman named Hugit Clark, who, whose estate was worth somewhere in excess of $300 million and included an $85 million mansion in Santa Barbara, California. And of course, as the story you know, gets reported on in various newspapers and news outlets, it kind of travels around the United States, and people are just absolutely shocked at the tragedy of a man who had extraordinary riches at his fingertips, but he lived and he died in poverty. I tell you that story because I believe that that's the story that's true um, for all of us. It um, doesn't have to play out in the same way that it did for him. Um, but if you're here today, um, you're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what I want to tell you is that in contained in that story are riches that are right at your fingertips. There is a life that Jesus Christ has purchased for you, that he desires for you to live, that is far and above any other life that you could ever possibly live. And yet many people live a life of emptiness and a life of poverty with this good news right at their fingertips. Today in particular, I want to talk to you about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means for us. And it is profound for us who are believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells us if there's no resurrection, uh, then our faith is in vain. If there's no resurrection, we are to be most pitied among men. If there is no resurrection, we're still in our sins. Uh, we're going to end up the same way that we came into this life. We'll spend eternity separated from God. 
But I believe that the resurrection did indeed happen, and I believe that it changes everything for us who are men and women of faith. And so I want to talk to you just about two things today. Uh, The first thing is why we believe in the resurrection, and the second thing, why it matters, uh, what we gain through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's tackle the first question first. Why do we believe the resurrection. Um, the, the first point I would want to make for you, uh, or may I offer for you to consider in evidence of the resurrection, is that the tomb was indeed empty. Now, almost nobody historically disputes the fact that the tomb was empty. Um, not the Romans, not the Jews, not the Pharisees, not the high priests, certainly not the disciples or the followers of Jesus. Uh, what we know historically, certainly that Pilate, the, the Roman governor of the time, that he sentenced a man he considered to be innocent to death on a cross. There on the cross, Jesus suffered and he bled and he died. There was a man named Joseph of Arimathea who was a rich man who had a tomb and he went to Pilate and requested the body of Jesus that he might bury him in his tomb. Uh, But before Pilate was going to allow this to happen, he sent a centurion to make sure Jesus was dead. As they went and they broke the, the legs of the other men who hung on the cross that day, they found Jesus had already perished. They, they thrust, the, thrust the spear through his side just to make sure that he had indeed expired. They took his body down and they placed it in the tomb. Now, the Pharisees, those uh, who had stirred up the Jews, the chief priests, they were concerned because Jesus had actually prophesied that he would rise again on the third day. And so they're talking with Pilate and they said, Hey, can you make sure, can you make certain that his disciples aren't going to come and steal him. Because if his body disappears within this three-day period, if he does indeed rise again on the third day as he prophesied, man, then we're never going to be able to stop this movement. And so Pilate, he dispatched a guard of Roman soldiers. This would have been 16 soldiers. They went to the tomb. They placed the stone over the entrance. They sealed it. And there, 16 Roman soldiers guarded the tomb on the first day and on the second day. But on the third, we get the account of Mary, the morning of the third day, she shows up. This is John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, this is John, by the way, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Now I want you to observe here that Mary at this point does not believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Mary Magdalene, who obviously loved Jesus, she had gone to care for him, to mourn and grieve the body of Christ who had been crucified. She believes that someone has taken the body of Jesus. The stone had been rolled away. So she goes and she gets Peter and John, and they're about to have a foot race, interestingly enough. Some of the details that the Bible includes shock me sometimes, but just to to spoil it for you, John was faster than Peter, uh, and and we, we hear that in the Scripture. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which, he had, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. And he saw and he believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And the disciples went back to their homes. Now again, the the first point that I would want you to consider as you think about the resurrection is that the tomb was empty. When the disciples came in, they found the linen cloths that they'd wrapped his body in preparing him for his burial. They found the linen cloths lying there. Now there is a theory out there that says somebody stole the body. Um, But if you were a grave robber, you were coming to steal the body of Jesus, you would think that after spending three days dead in the Palestinian climate, those grave cloths would be your friend, right? The last thing you would want to do is unwrap the body, and yet the linen cloths are lying there. Someone who was stealing the body, which was under guard by 16 Roman soldiers, took the time to fold up the face cloth uh, before they removed him. It doesn't sound very probable to me. Now, Again, not even the Jews nor the Romans dispute that the tomb was empty. As a matter of fact, the, those who were guarding the tomb, the, the soldiers there, they got together with the, the Jews, with the Pharisees, and they con- talk, concocted the story that the disciples had come and indeed stolen the body of Jesus Christ. And yet to this day, 
It's never been found. It's never been identified. There is no body there. Again, the first evidence I want to offer you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that the tomb was empty. Now, that doesn't tell us that Jesus was raised, but something profound happened on that day that literally changed the course of history, and it began with an empty tomb. The second thing that I would want you to consider would be the steadfast disciples of Jesus. Now, I, you may not know this, but around the time of Christ, let's say within 100 years, 50 years before and 50 years after, there were uh, uh, about a dozen men who claimed to be the Messiah. There were others who had come forth. Now, they didn't all claim in the same way that Jesus did, right? This still happens in our day. Uh, when I was a kid, it was uh, David Koresh and the Branch Davidians down in Waco, right? Kind of a deranged men who think that they are indeed God in the flesh, and they claim to do so. Um, this happened about a dozen times within 100 years of the life of Jesus. Uh, but one thing accompanied every other um, person who claimed to be the Messiah. When this messianic figure died... The movement died with them, whether they were crucified by the Romans or something happened to them individually. When the leader died, the movement died with them. But that wasn't the case with Jesus. As a matter of fact, in the, in the case of the death of Jesus, I would argue that the movement that surrounded Jesus, the Messianic movement, those who believed that he was indeed the Savior, uh, when Jesus died on the cross, they were only strengthened. The movement only grew stronger. It only grew wider. Those who were disciples only grew more steadfast in their belief. As a matter of fact, Christianity, upon being persecuted in Jerusalem, began to spread outside of that city and all around the known world, such that today, 2,000 years later, Later, men and women all across the world are gathering and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, believing the gospel in every country and every language among every tribe. People are claiming the name of Jesus Christ, and that simply defies all the odds. It didn't happen with any other of the messianic figures. It hasn't happened with any other religion. When the, when the founder dies, the movement dies with it, but not so with Jesus. You take the man Peter. Do you remember what happened to Peter just before Jesus was crucified? He was kind of a boisterous guy, right? Kind of bold. He shot his mouth off like some of us do. And he said to Jesus, hey, I will never deny you. Even if it costs me my life, Jesus, I will never deny you. And Jesus said, Peter, tonight before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Jesus, I'll never deny you. But remember what happened when he was arrested? When Jesus got arrested and they took him to the house of the high priest, and Peter's just outside the house. Maybe he's peering in the window there in the courtyard of the high priest. And someone said, hey, weren't you one of those guys that ran around with Jesus? Are you a disciple of his? No. No, I don't even know who Jesus is. Three times on that night, he denied even knowing who Jesus was. But then something profound happened to Peter. Something profound that reshaped his thinking, that gave him a boldness and a courage that would never leave him for the rest of his life. Peter, the man who had denied knowing Jesus prior to the crucifixion, became the leader of the entire church, the founder of the movement, if you will, of the whole church movement. He was the, the one who was in prison for his faith. He was the one who was beaten for his faith. He was ultimately martyred for his faith without recanting. And so we ask ourselves, what happened to Peter that moved him from someone who was a denier that, Jesus was, that he even knew Jesus to someone who was a defender of the faith? You take James, the brother of Jesus. If you read in, in John's gospel a little bit earlier, you're going to see that James was not a believer in Jesus either. He didn't believe that he was the Messiah. As a matter of fact, on one of the trips Jesus made to his hometown, he was there with his family, um, they actually asked him to leave. It seems that James and his brothers were a little bit ashamed of Jesus because they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe that he was the Christ, the Messiah at all. They asked him to leave, maybe so they wouldn't be embarrassed anymore. And yet this brother, James, who was an outspoken denier of Jesus, became an ardent defender of the faith, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, maintaining his faith even when they threw him from the temple and beat him to death with clubs. The final person I would have you think about is the Apostle Paul. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a well-known intellectual in his day, highly educated and highly influential, worked his way up through the ranks of Judaism, he was proud and zealous for the traditions there within uh, the, the Jews. He was so zealous for his faith that he persecuted Christians, had some imprisoned. He gave approval as others were put to death. 
And yet something happened in the life of Paul that so dramatically changed him that the chief persecutor of the church became its chief evangelist. You look at about two-thirds of the New Testament, they were written by this man, Paul, who at first persecuted the church. And so we ask ourselves, what happened to Peter? What happened to James? And what happened to Paul? That after the crucifixion of Jesus, they became so confident and courageous and defenders of the faith. And you know what is common, all three of those men have in common? All three of those men claim to have seen the risen Christ. And it dramatically changed their lives and the lives of so many others such that Christianity flourished and grew. And 2,000 years later, we are here and we are celebrating the risen Christ. So evidence number one, there was an empty tomb. doesn't tell us a lot. But then we have these disciples that were so steadfast in what they saw, even being willing to die for what they had seen on that day, their testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. The final thing that I would want to point you toward today are the multitude of witnesses who saw him. We have an account here in John chapter 20 of Mary, first of all. Read with me in verse 11. It says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb as she wept and stood to look into the tomb. Now, just a little bit of a detail here for you. When Jews in the first century wept and mourned when they lost somebody, it wasn't, wasn't in the same way that we mourn today. Now, I don't know how you are. Everyone handles death and loss differently. Uh, generally, if you're a man in our culture, uh, you're allowed like a tear or two, right? You can cry a little bit, but it's not overt. It's not loud. There's not a lot of wailing at funerals today. Um, That wasn't the case in the first century uh, within Judaism. As a matter of fact, they would pay people to come in and be paid mourners. And so you would sit with the family and those who'd endured loss, and they would weep, and they would wail, and they would offer these loud laments on on, on behalf of the person who had died. When you see that Mary here was weeping, don't think of a single tear running down her cheek. You should see wailing. You should see overwhelming grief and sorrow for Jesus. As she wept, she stooped to look in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. At this point, Mary still doesn't believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead. She's still looking for the body. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Now, this this seems unusual, and yet in the midst of such overwhelming grief, tear-filled eyes, she didn't recognize who was standing right in front of her. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed him to be the the gardener and, and said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary... He calls her by name and she recognizes this is indeed Christ. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have yet to ascend to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. The first appearance, resurrected appearance of Jesus was to a woman. Now, this would be an awfully unusual way if you were fabricating a story in the first century, an awfully unusual way for you to introduce a resurrected Savior because women weren't seen as credible in the first century, not among Judaism, not among the Greeks, not among the Romans. Women weren't viewed as uncredible, if you will. They wouldn't have listened, and yet, for whatever reason, Jesus chose to appear to a woman first. But he didn't stop there. He goes on, and he appears to Peter, and he appears to James, He appeared to the apostles, his disciples who had followed him. Uh, The the apostle Thomas, you might have heard him referred to as doubting Thomas, said, unless I see him, unless I see the wounds in his hands and the hole in his side, I will not believe. And yet Thomas became a defender of the faith. It went so far as this. Jesus appeared to 500 witnesses at one time. The Apostle Paul testified to this in his letter to the Corinthians. It was written within about 40 years of the death of Christ. And he wrote this letter to the Corinthians. He said, "Um, Jesus appeared to 500 witnesses, most of whom are still alive. And he included that detail so that anyone who would have heard or read the letter could have gone and found one of those witnesses and said, what did you see? 
And did, what did you hear on that day? Was it really the Christ? Did you see the, the scars, the wounds in his hand? Did you see the hole in his side? Was it really Jesus? You could have gone not to one and not to two and not to ten, not to fifty, but five hundred witnesses who all saw this at the same time. So today I can't prove to you the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All I can tell you is that the tomb was empty. And I can tell you that there were disciples who remained steadfast, even being willing to be martyred for their faith. And I can tell you that there are a multitude of witnesses, were a multitude of witnesses to the resurrected Christ. And the movement has grown today, putting millions upon millions and millions of people who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus because the resurrection changes everything. The first question I wanted to answer for you is why we believe in the resurrection. And to be honest with you, I've just scratched the surface. If you are a skeptic, uh, you're in good company. Many of us here were exactly the same. Didn't necessarily believe in Christ on the front end, uh, needed to pursue the things of faith, and I would just encourage you to continue to dig in to the resurrection of Jesus, to, to weigh it, to, to think about it, to pursue it. But I would also encourage you to look into this, and that would be, why does it matter? Why is the resurrection so important to Christians? Why is this event so profoundly shape what we believe? What do we gain through the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The first thing, and maybe the most compelling on the front end for us as believers, is this. The resurrection of Jesus gives us hope for our path, past. You see, the story of Jesus and the resurrection is that he rose from the grave victorious over sin and over death. Uh, here's, I'm going to give you the gospel really quickly because this is profoundly important to understanding why the resurrection is so significant to us. The scriptures tell us that we have all, all have sinned. I don't know about you, but uh, as for me, that's absolutely true. It's true for us. If you've lived on, in this life on this earth, you too have sinned. Maybe you've even done things that you thought you would never do, right? You sinned in ways that you shouldn't. It just means that you missed the mark in terms of adhering to the righteous standard of God. And what happened when you sinned is that sin in your life, it became like a dividing wall between God and you. God, who is perfectly holy, could not have fellowship with us who were utterly sinful. There was this dividing wall between us and God that was sin. But God, who wasn't out to just judge the world, who wasn't out to crush us, who wasn't out to punish us, but God, who loved us so overwhelmingly, he saw you. He saw me. On my good days, and on those not quite so solid days, and on those days, I still think about the days that I still regret, those moments that I'm so ashamed of, God saw it all. And he demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still yet sinners, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. So Jesus, the one and only son of God, he took on flesh. He lived a perfect, sinless life here on this earth. And he went to the cross to suffer and to die for us. The scriptures tell us the wages of sin is death. Jesus went to the cross to be our substitute, to endure the punishment that we deserve. There on the cross, God took the sins of those of us who would come to faith in Christ. He took all of our sins and he placed them on Jesus. He took them away from us, right? So if you're uh, looking at a bank ledger here, right, you owe a debt over here. Jesus took our debt and on the cross, he paid that debt in full. And God took that righteous life of Jesus and he credited that to our account. So for those of us who have faith in Christ, our sins have been taken away. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our past. He doesn't see our sin. He doesn't see that awful day we're ashamed of. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what's been credited to us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ where Jesus rose victorious over sin and death. It gives us hope for our past that our sins have been taken away. We didn't deserve that. We didn't earn that from God. We didn't live good enough lives that somehow God would smile on us and forgive us. It was all the work of God, all we brought to the table was our sin. And yet Jesus Christ paid the price for our sin. The debt has been paid in full, and we have forgiveness in him. So the resurrection of Jesus, it gives us hope for our past, but it also gives us hope for our present. If you live very long in this life, you know um, we struggle in a couple of different ways. The first one is we struggle with sin. 
I've been in ministry now for 18 years, and what I know is that in every single row, probably in most every single life, is a person sitting that battles against sin. And maybe for you, it's that overwhelming addiction that is controlling your life. Maybe for you, it's unforgiveness or bitterness or anger. Maybe for you, your heart is full of greed and you don't even want it to be that way, but you can't overcome it on your own. Again, I would want to remind you that Jesus Christ Through the resurrection, he rose victorious over sin, victorious over death. And and here's what I want want you to see. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And what he did there in the grave through his death and burial and resurrection, his victory over sin was he afforded us the opportunity to find freedom from sin. No longer walking according to the weakness of our flesh, but now walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, we too can experience freedom over sin and the things that once controlled us. There is hope for our present. I don't know how bad it is for you. I don't know what your finances look like. I don't know how deep of a hole that you're in, but I want you to know that there is hope for our present. I don't know how bad your marriage is. I don't know how deep the hole of depression is that you're walking in right now, but I want you to know that there is hope for our present because Jesus Christ is sovereign over all things. If he's victorious over the grave, he's victorious over the thing that currently you're battling against. Jesus is ruling and reigning now in heaven over every other thing. And there is hope for us in the person and in the power of Jesus Christ. The resurrection, it gives us hope for our past, and it gives us hope for our present. Can I tell you that you're not what you once were? That in Christ Jesus, you're not your past And you're not what people said about you. You're not the person that you were in high school or that person you were through most of your adult life. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that carries through to the day. You are not defeated by your sin. You see, what what Jesus did there on the cross, where he atoned for our sin, remember that dividing wall, God was here, we were here, and there was dividing wall of sin. What Jesus did was he tore down that wall such that we can now have communion with God. We can walk with Him, and we can talk with Him. We can interact with the God of the universe, the eternal God of all creation that wants to have a relationship with you. He knew Mary's name, and He knows yours. And He is coming after you. He wants to give you victory. He wants to give you freedom. He wants to give you that abundant and eternal life. And the final reason we celebrate the resurrection today is we have hope for the future. What we know is going to happen to all of us unless Jesus Christ returns sooner. For every single one of us, one day we're going to breathe our last breath here on this earth. I've had to do a lot of funerals over the course of my uh, time in ministry. And some of those are funerals that are celebrations. Someone that lived a good, long life. You know, they love Jesus and they love their family and we just get to celebrate. I've also done funerals for infants that just lived a a few months, young people that just lived a few years. And a question that often gets asked in the case of someone who dies very young is, why would God create someone to just let them live for a couple of days or weeks or months or years? Why would God create someone and then, you know, take them so quickly? Why Why would God create somebody to only let them live for such a short time? The answer to that question is that he didn't. God created us to live forever. That the end of this life is not all that there is. The scriptures tell us that when we breathe our last breath here, we will spend an eternity in one of two places. We will spend eternity in heaven with God, ruling and reigning with Him in a place where there's no more sickness, no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow. A place of eternal joy, eternal peace, full of love. Or we'll spend an eternity in a place called hell a place where God is not separated from God in a place of eternal torment. But for those of us who have come to faith in Christ, we have hope for our future. Because when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are now adopted as his children. We are, giving, we are given that abundant life that begins today and extends into eternity. We begin walking with God today, and we continue to do so all the way into eternity. There will be a day where we all perish from this life. These physical bodies will be no more. 
But the scriptures tell us that there's a day there will be a new heaven and a new earth and we'll have a new body and we will reign with him forever in heaven. Today I, I began with a story of a man by the name of Timothy Henry Gray, a man who was extraordinarily wealthy, who died a life alone and impoverished. He suffered a great deal here on this earth. And it was so tragic because in the back pocket of that man was a wallet, and in that wallet was a check. It was a check made out for enough money that he could have lived a great life. He wouldn't have had to suffer in the, in the cold and alone. He could have enjoyed many of the nicer things of this world. And yet, tragically, he never cashed in. Here's what I want to tell you today about Jesus Christ. The price has been paid for you to live that abundant and victorious life in him. The price has been paid for your sin to be atoned for, for your sin to be taken away, for you to live in victory over what you're walking through today. The price has been paid for you to spend an eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. And the way that we come into a relationship with God, the way that we receive this free gift that God has given to us is simply this. By grace, through faith alone. Salvation is a gift from God that we receive not by living a good enough life that somehow God nods his head at us and we're good, right? It's not received by, you know, avoiding enough of the wrong things and doing enough of the good things that maybe we kind of tilt the scales in our favor. We receive salvation in Jesus Christ by trusting, not in ourselves, but instead trusting in the work of Jesus Christ, his death and his burial and his resurrection for us. In faith, we receive the gift that he's given to us. So right now, I'm going to ask that you would bow your heads right now. If you're here today, and you don't know Jesus Christ, and you're interested in understanding more about the gospel, about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, about how to receive this gift of salvation, would you be so bold as just here in this moment to lift your hand and say, Jason, would you just pray for me? Thank you. Anybody else that's here today say, Jason, I'm not sure that I'm walking in this life that, that God has for me. I'm not walking in freedom. Man, my past is still overwhelming. I, I live a life of guilt and shame and I want to be free. Would you be so bold as to raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. I want to say a word of prayer for you today. Father, uh, for every person who raised their hand that recognizes, God, that they're a sinner and that they're in need of a Savior, God, they see that your death and burial and resurrection is what gives us victory in this life from our sin and from our past, from our shame, victory in our, our, our present and victory in our future. Father, I pray that you would continue to draw their hearts to you in faith. I pray that today would be the day of salvation where they are set free. For the person that's out there, that they're still wrestling, they're still wandering, Father, I pray that you would call them by name. I pray that you would draw their hearts. I pray that you wouldn't stop until they surrender in faith to you. Lord, would you save today? Would you transform today? We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.